My name is Ara Suksi, most of you know. I am the director of the School for Advanced Studies in the Arts and Humanities. <laughs> it is so great to see you all. It feels like it's been way too long. Um, before we begin, I want to acknowledge the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lunapewak, and Attawandran peoples who have taken care of the lands where we do our work at Western. The treaties that are specific to this area are the Two-Row Wampum Belt Treaty of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy Silver Covenant Chain, the Beaver Hunting Grounds of the Haudenosaunee Nanfan Treaty of 1701, the McKee Treaty of 1790, the London Township Treaty of 1796, the Huron Track Treaty of 1827 with the Anishinaabe, and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee. These lands are still home to diverse indigenous peoples who are vital contributors to society in many ways and from whom we have so much to learn. The three indigenous nations that are closest neighbors to Western are the Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and the Muncie Delaware Nation, who all continue to live as sovereign nations with individual and unique languages, cultures, and customs. This land acknowledgement is intended as a repeated reminder of the larger acts required by the truth and reconciliation process and to encourage us to stay on a path of learning and actions. So as we celebrate SASA's 10th year this year, it's extremely exciting for me to welcome our first guest in the SASA Speaker Series who is also an alumna of SASA. Mariam Goloshani graduated with the first SASA cohort in 2017, and she was the first SASA gold medal student. She was also, uh, she also did an English major, and she was in scholars electives. She then stayed at Western to complete her master's in theory and criticism. Today, Mariam is a senior medical student at the University of Toronto, Drawing upon her interdisciplinary education, Mariam has significantly contributed to developing the health humanities in Canada through her research, education, and public engagement. Mariam is here this afternoon to speak about literary lessons on doctoring, reflections on madness and medicine through feminist literature and theory. Please join me in welcoming her. everyone. Um, can you hear me okay at the back? Yeah? Oh my gosh, so many familiar faces. It kind of makes me want to cry because I was just telling um, Dr. Milde about how at U of T, no one cares about me. I'm just a number. <laughs> and I had the best time at Western. So it feels rather surreal to be on the side of the podium a decade after I started at Western. I started in science, but after just one semester, I met Dr. Faflak, who very quickly convinced me to, to switch into this strange new experimental program that no one really knew what it was about. It had a very long-winded and somewhat pretentious name, the School for Advanced Studies in the Arts and Humanities. I then stayed at Western to work on my master's with Dr. Faflak again, in this time another endearingly weird and somewhat pretentious department, the Center for the Study of Theory and Criticism. I'm now in one of the most normative, rigid, and definitely pretentious programs, medical school at the University of Toronto. My time at Western's Faculty of Arts left me wholly prepared and at the same time completely unprepared for medical school. I had a hell of a lot of catching up to do with regards to how the body literally works and more importantly, how it comes to sometimes not work or work in the wrong ways. But this talk is about how the world of literature and theory prepared me to care for people when their bodies and minds don't work or work in the wrong ways. Before I begin, I'm here as a settler having lived and learned my entire life on land governed by the dish with one spoon wampum. Western, as we just heard, is located on the territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lenape, Quick, sorry, I pronounced that one bad every time, and Attawandran people and nations. I'm forever indebted to the work of many brilliant Indigenous writers and thinkers whom I was first introduced, introduced to during my time at Western, albeit often in spite of, not because of, my mostly Western education, pun intended, haha. Um, I can only hope to pay this debt forward through 
a medical practice as a student for now and a physician later in ways that actively work to undo the violence colonial medicine has done and continues to do to indigenous peoples across the settler nation state we call Canada. This includes, but is not limited to, the Canadian medical system's complicity in the genocide of hundreds, likely thousands of indigenous children who are violently forced through the Indian residential school system. This is documented first and foremost in stories and trauma indigenous people hold amongst themselves and are immensely generous when they do sometimes share them with settlers like me. There's also a wealth of academic work on the topic, including Maureen Lux's book, Separate Beds, A History of Indian Hospitals in Canada, which I really recommend reading, if, especially if you're also interested in working in healthcare. I'm now nearing the end of medical school at the University of Toronto, which is located on the territories of the Mississaugas at the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now also home to countless other First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. This land is covered under Treaty 13 and the Williams Treaties. I remind myself that the varied and nuanced Indigenous healing practices are not the alternative medicine. Indeed, those are the actual medicines of this place, and what I am predominantly learning at U of T is what is the alternative medicine of this place, specifically a colonial one. Now to begin. But some ways, some may say, you are here at medical school to become a doctor. What has that got to do with literature, with philosophy, with the humanities? I'll try to explain. In my second year of university, I was assigned Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own in an introductory course on feminist theory. It was my first time reading anything by Woolf, and it was my first time ascending into madness. I was captivated by her first word, but, by her first sentence, a question, and by her first use of I, I will try to explain, she writes, in response to her own question about what a room of one's own has got to do with women in fiction. Wolf is not going to explain, but will try to explain. This distinction matters. Further down that first page, she continues, I should never be able to come to a conclusion. I should never be able to fulfill what is, I understand, the first duty of a lecturer. To hand you after an hour's discourse a nugget of pure truth to wrap between the pages of your notebooks and keep on the mantelpiece forever. At 19 years old, just in my second year of university, I was stunned by Wolf's words, her questions, her open hesitations, her meandering thoughts, her use of but, her rejection of everything I had been taught a good essay required, let alone good writing or even good thinking. I didn't know it at the time, but Wolf offered my first lesson on doctoring. I should never be able to come to a final, decisive conclusion when working with patients. I should never be able to fulfill what is, I understand, the supposed first duty of a doctor, to hand the patient after a 10-minute appointment a nugget of pure truth, a fact about their body-mind. I will try to listen and perhaps explain when appropriate. I will try my best to care, treat, cure, and manage a suffering body-mind, but I will never, ever wholly understand what it is to really live in that particular one. Wolf goes on to write that she is going to develop in our presence as fully and freely as she can the train of thought which led her to think this, this being her argument about women needing money in a room um, to write. When a subject is a highly controversial one, and any question about sex is that, one cannot hope to tell the truth. One can only give one's audience the chance of drawing their own conclusions as they observe the limitations, the prejudices, the idiosyncrasies of the speaker. The subject of doctoring, of what makes a good doctor, is also highly controversial. So taking Wolf's lead, I can only hope for my talk to give you the chance to draw your own conclusions about what makes a good doctor. And I will try to do so by developing here, in your presence, my own train of thoughts and experiences as fully and freely as I can. It's taken nearly a decade for me to understand, perhaps partially, what it is to live in my own unruly body-mind. But I will try to explain. A Room of One's Own was not the only book I read and reread during that frenzied flurry of activity that characterized my second year of university and first episode of Hypomania. It was also the year I started reading and learning about medicine through the humanities. I remember starting with one of the most seminal texts in the field, Susan Sontag's Illness as Metaphor. Through a close analysis of the metaphors associated with tuberculosis and cancer, Sontag endeavored to, in her own words, liberate us from the lurid metaphors that unhelpfully plague our modern understanding and experiences of illness. Yet, in a rather ironic, though I think actually very intentional twist, she ends up firmly establishing her own metaphor for illness that still grips us decades after she published the book in 1978. In the book's very first paragraph, Sontag famously writes, Welcome. Um, every, Sontag famously writes, 
Everyone who is born holds dual citizenship in the kingdom of the well and in the kingdom of the sick. Illness is a place, a kingdom, with its own landscape, governance, and rules of citizenship. So too is wellness, and in between is implied some kind of clearly demarcated border. That's okay. In our contemporary age of illness, some may even call it a postmodern age of illness, this border must be vast, a land unto its own. So vast indeed that it may be even more populated than either the kingdom of the ill or the kingdom of the well. While the modern area of illness was characterized by more or less acute illnesses, like infections, from which one was either cured or died, today's advances in medicine mean that most people live somewhere along the spectrum from well to ill to dead. This spectrum includes various states of pre-illness like pre-diabetes and pre-cancer, as well as a more general state of living under an ever-looming medical gaze that sees us as walking risk factors and bodies to be preventatively screened. This spectrum also includes various states of remission, chronic illness, disability, and side effects from medical treatments that leave many living at the borders of illness and health. I do not think Sontag was intentionally ignoring what was going on in this borderland, but rather evidence of how damn good medicine is at marginalizing and masking this borderland. Even I missed it the first few times I read illness as metaphor. And so does here I find my second lesson on doctoring. Pay careful attention to the spaces in between, what is missing, who is missing, what is left unsaid, and most especially, what the institutions and systems you work in both intentionally and unintentionally hide, avoid, and push to the margin. Around the same time I was learning through Sontag how culture in its most general sense shapes experiences of illness and health, I was also starting to learn how culture in its most particular sentences, that is of particular races, ethnicities, religions, and so forth, also shape those experiences. I first learned this through reading Anne Fadiman's seminal piece of medical anthropology slash ethnography, The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down, A Hmong Child, Her American Doctors, and the Collision of Two Cultures. Whereas Sontag opens her book looking for illness and health in their respective kingdoms, Fadiman opens her book looking for what is happening at the border. She writes, I have always felt that the action most worth watching is not at the center of things, but where the edges meet. I like shorelines, weather fronts, international borders. There are interesting frictions and incongruities in these places, and often, if you stand at the point of tangency, you can see both sides better than if you were in the middle of either one. I too have always found the edges where things meet interesting. But unlike Fodingman, myself and many others do not have the privilege of just watching these interesting frictions and incongruities from the safe distance of tangency. In her book, Borderlands slash La Frontera, the new Mestiza, Gloria Anzal Dua writes that the Mestiza, a kind of plural intersectional self, stands at the very juncture Fadiman watches from afar, that focal point or fulcrum where phenomena tend to collide. As I was madly reading works by white women like Wolf, Sontag, and Fadiman, I was also becoming mad in the other sense as I was becoming increasingly conscious of my experiences of living the in-between, especially a brown body from over there and a white world over here, where I experienced the frictions and incongruities of the border as injustices and oppression. Women writers of color like Ansel Dewar were giving me the language and insight to identify and process these experiences for the first time. Ansel Dewar describes the borderland in which the mestiza lives as a, quote, vague and undetermined place created by the emotional residue of an unnatural boundary, like that between illness and health. And in this place, tension grips the inhabitants like a virus. And like with most viral infections, the treatment is often to just weather the storm. Anne Zeldua goes on to share her wisdom. It is not enough to stand on the opposite riverbank, shouting questions, challenging patriarchal white conventions. At some point on our way to a new con consciousness, we will have to leave the opposite bank so that we are on both sides, both shores at once. Or perhaps we will decide to disengage from the dominant culture, write it off altogether as a lost cause, and cross the border into a wholly new and separate territory. Or we might go another route. The possibilities are numerous once we decide to act and not react. To act and not react. To react was to be mad. To be clear, Ansel Dua does not deny the legitimacy and importance of this anger. I was often mad at school, to riff off the title of Margaret Price's book. Price opens her book, Mad at School, just like Wolf does in A Room of One's Own. That is, with a question. If you are crazy, can you still be of sound mind? I say, no, I yell, hell yes. Yes, I was mad in the crazy sense that second year of undergrad and many times again throughout my decade of university of education. But I was also often soundly mad in the angry sense. 
mad at injustices towards which the only truly sound rational reaction is indeed to be enraged. Unfortunately, women, especially women of color, are endlessly dismissed as hysterical for expressing such anger, and medicine has to do with this. But in the face of this, Anzal Dua pushes me not to not just get trapped in a never-ending cycle of ang angry reactions. This is a lesson I will forever struggle to embody. But practicing medicine is one of the ways in which I've chosen to act amidst the numerous possibilities. These numerous possibilities can also leave one, quote, floundering in uncharted seas, as Anzal Dua beautifully describes. But in this floundering, the mestiza, quote, discovers that she can't hold concepts or ideas in rigid boundaries. The new mestiza copes by developing a tolerance for contradictions, a tolerance for ambiguity. This tolerance for ambiguity is my third lesson on doctoring, and let me tell you, nothing builds your tolerance for ambiguity like reading literature and theory. By 2015, I embarked on a literal border crossing as I moved to Scotland to study at the University of St. Andrews for a year. I arrived in St. Andrews mildly mad from that previous year, previous year, but also mildly depressed as I began to come down from what I would later learn to be my very first hypomanic episode. There was perhaps no better place to experience such intensities of emotion than at a historic seaside town perched on cliffs looking out over the North Sea, a frigid, turbulent, but stunning expanse. The town and university, founded in 1413, truly look like they're out of a storybook. The roads are paved with cobblestones. Every building and house look like a castle to my suburban North American sensibilities. Breathtaking gardens and quads could be found around every corner, and the entire town was framed by stunning golf courses, beaches, ravines, and rolling hills with sheep. Even many years later, St. Andrews would still find ways to overwhelm and surprise me with its beauty. I enrolled in a course focused entirely on Virginia Woolf's writing with two of the most eminent Woolf scholars. I knew the opportunity to study Woolf with these professors in a classroom overlooking the North Sea was a magnificent privilege. And yet, as a depressed fog settled in around my mind that fall, I could barely take in any of the lectures, let alone the texts we were assigned. I, remem I barely remember anything I read that semester, but I do remember struggling to absorb Wolf's words as I sat in my favorite cafe on dark, rainy afternoons and evenings as the sun began setting early and earlier into the winter. I was suffering in a way I'd never experienced before, and yet it is still so easy to lo look back and romanticize those days. There's a temptation to draw poetic parallels between the unpredictable storm that was brewing in my mind and St. Andrew's own descent into its predictably dark, stormy winter. There's also a temptation to draw a poetic parallel between Wolf's words, so often reflective of her own manic depressive illness, and my own. Into the Lighthouse, there's a particularly haunting description of, of an empty home on Scotland's Isle of Skies that is ravaged by a storm. Wolf writes, Night after night, summer and winter, the torment of storms, the arrow-like stillness of fine, had there been anyone to listen, from the upper rooms of the empty house, only gigantic chaos streaked with lightning could have been heard tumbling and tossing, as the winds and waves disported themselves like amorphous bulks of leviathans, whose brows are pierced by no light of reason and mounted one on top of another and lunged and plunged in the darkness or the daylight, for night and day, month and year ran shapelessly together, in idiot games, until it seemed as if the universe were battling and tumbling in brute confusion and wanton lust aimlessly by itself. Despite my depression at the time, I still remembered this passage, if only in a vague sense. Not the specific words, but the mood it stirred up in me, even if I could only name that mood in retrospect. To the Lighthouse is more a novel about philosophical introspection than storylines and characters. There's an allure to transforming my own descent from mild mania to depression into a similarly beautiful metaphor of stormy evenings threatening to overcome an empty home filled only with deep introspective thoughts. But I have to stop myself. There was no profound introspection of occupying my, time, my mind at that time, just profound sadness, hopelessness, and confusion. There wasn't anything romantic about my first descent into major depression, just as there isn't anything romantic about Wolf being a stunningly creative and talented writer who tied far too young of manic depressive illness. This was another lesson Wolf offered me on doctoring. Illness tempts romanticization at every turn, and yet that is too easy and sometimes even dangerous. I must resist erasing the seriousness of suffering. Manic depressive illness, or bipolar disorder as we know it today, has a particularly storied history of romanticization due to its relationship to artistic creativity. In her book, Touched with Fire, Kay Redfield Jameson traces this history and makes the case that while it's tempting to think of manic depression as a symptom of artistic genius, or more dangerously, of, as a driver of such creativity, 
it actually more often wreaked unbearable suffering, unproductivity, and even death upon artists from Van Gogh to Wolf. It's tempting to think the world would not have been blessed with these artists' brilliant works if they hadn't been ill. But perhaps we would have actually had even more brilliant work had they not suffered so greatly and not died so young. Regardless, no amount of creative work for us to consume now can ever justify have someone having had to suffer so greatly to create it in the first place. And yet, so many do manage to create beauty out of, in the midst of, or even in spite of illness and suffering more generally. Perhaps no one does this as powerfully as Indigenous writers and artists. Once I was back at Western to finish my undergrad, I was introduced to the literary works of Heisla author Eden Robinson. Her first novel, novel, Monkey Beach, follows the journey of a teenage Heisla girl named Lisa Marie as she copes with her brother having disappeared at sea. The novel opens with Lisa Marie hearing six crows speak to her in Heisla. Lass, they say to her, but she cannot remember precisely what that Heisla word means. And so the novel starts with this split sign, a separation from the Heisla language and ways of knowing slash living, a central theme of the novel and a product of intergenerational colonial violence that plagues Lisa Marie. Later on, Lisa Marie asks her mother, did you hear the crows earlier? They were talking to me. They said la s. It's probably... She is cut off by her mother, Gladys, who interjects, clearly a sign, Lisa, that you need Prozac. Here, the split sign is defenseless against a dangerous substitution. Talking crows is, for Gladys, a sign that Lisa Marie is mentally ill, crazy, the one who needs to be cured with a drug like Prozac. In contrast, for Lisa Marie's grandmother, Mama U, the talking crows are a sign of Lisa Marie's burgeoning gift as a Heisla hero. Healer, <laughs> although hero too. A gift her mother, Gladys, actually once had, but now suppresses. Mama U explains why. When Gladys was very young, lots of death going on, TB, flu, drinking, diseases. She used to know who was going to die next, but that kind of gift, she makes people nervous, hey? Gladys now wants to protect her own daughter from this trauma she experienced at the hands of Western medicine's complicity in colonial violence. And yet, she ends up doing so by drawing upon the same Western medicine that harmed her. Prozac names and thereby constructs Lisa Marie as mentally ill, while also offering itself as the cure to her supposed mental illness. In the same way both diseases and their cures were brought by settlers to Turtle Island and justified colonization in a violent circular logic, Prozac as a sign for both disease and cure justifies the colonization of Heisler healing practices by Western medicine, especially psychiatry. This is an immense and ongoing, there is an immense and ongoing history of psychiatry medicalizing the experience of hearing voices, like those of the crows, as a symptom of psychotic disorder, especially schizophrenia, which is supposedly the most definitively biological of all mental illnesses, which must, I am taught, always be treated with antipsychotic drugs. This medicalization and frequent forced treatment of those who hear voices is disproportionately acted, enacted upon those who are poor and not white most often being, being people who are black or indigenous or not from here. This is just one of the many ways psychiatry and Western medicine more broadly enacts as colonial violence. Prozac is not actually an antipsychotic that would effectively treat auditory hallucinations. It's an antidepressant, but nonetheless, we get Gladys's point. Lisa Marie hearing voices means she is mentally ill, psychotropic medications are the cure, and Prozac names this by virtue of being a very slippery sign in contemporary society since its brilliant marketing in the 1990s onwards. A similarly slippery sign that dates back centuries is the pharmacon, an ancient Greek word that has been variously translated as drug, medicine, remedy, poison, recipe, or filter. Jacques Derrida explores the slippery word in his reading of Plato's Phaedrus, wherein writing operates as a pharmacon. In her book, Gut Feminism, Elizabeth Wilson explains this well. Writing is both a remedy to memory and a poisoning of memory. It both strengthens and weakens the mind. Despite appearances, Derrida argues remedy and harm are not detached from each other. Rather, there are ongoing negotiations between a remedy and its harms, such that remedy is always reliant on the harms it excludes. Just as the pharmacon emerges in Plato's Phaedrus, quote, first and foremost by the redoubtable, irreducible difficulty of translation, Prozac too emerges, emerges as a pharmacon in Monkey Beach from Lisa Murray's initial difficulty translating the Heisel word last to English. And Prozac operates as a pharmacon in Monkey Beach by offering itself as the remedy for Lisa Murray's supposed mental illness while also poisoning her potential as a Heisel he healer. 
Psychotropic medications like Prozac are notorious for treating mental symptoms like anxiety, low mood, delusions, and hallucinations, but at the cost of a host of side effects like affective blunting, decreased libido, stomach upset, diabetes, movement disorders, and more. What is especially interesting about Prozac is how this particular antidepressant, like Xanax as an anxiolytic, is no longer just a biochemical substance. Derrida explains how the essence of the pharmacon lies in the way in which, having no stable essence, no proper characteristics, it is not, in any sense of the word, a substance. Prozac is similarly no longer just a pharmaceutical substance. Rather, with its own entry in the Oxford English Dictionary, Prozac exists as a substance fluoxetine as well as a linguistic pharmacon, signifying both mental illness, the harm, and its cure in our everyday lexicon. Wilson perfectly points out that what is harmful about fluoxetine slash Prozac is harmful about the psychocultural landscape in general. There can be no absolute distinction between the pill and the world, and between the remedies and injuries they enact. But to be clear, Wilson, nor I for that matter, are against the role of drugs in the treatment of mental health conditions. She clarifies, the issue is not one of siding with drugs or siding with words or replacing one with the other but of tracking the relation of sympathy, fellow feeling, between words and pills. Gladys is ultimately using pills, Prozac, to dismiss the word, la s, that Lisa Marie hears from a place of deep empathy. She's striving to protect her daughter from the added colonial trauma of foreshadowing death as a Heisla healer. In both contrast and parallel, Lisa Marie's grandmother, when counseling Lisa Marie on her Heisla healing gifts, cautions that, quote, Good medicine and bad. It's like oxisuli, powerful medicine, very dangerous. It can kill you. It protects you from ghosts, spirits, bad medicine. Thus, Heisler healing traditions and the medicinal plant oxisuli in particular also operate as a kind of pharmacon with the potential to both hurt and heal. Yet this pharmacon's power is harnessed by Heisla women like Lisa Marie and Mama U in very different ways and to very different ends than psychiatry's use of psychotropic drugs like Prozac. Lisa Marie's journey of discovering and reckoning with her gifts as a Heisler hero, as healer, is part and parcel with her journey to heal the ruptured relationship with her Heisler community, family, language, culture, and land. And in writing Monkey Beach, Robin her Robinson herself uses writing to tell a nuanced, sensitive story of indigenous girlhood as a remedy to intergenerational trauma. Writing here function, writing itself functions as pharmacon. Métis writer Joanna Piscinu explains that from an indigenous perspective, stories are a type of medicine and like medicine can be healing or poisonous. Stories can be poisonous, like those told to legitimize and perpetuate colonialism, and healing like those told by Robinson and Monkey Beach. Indigenous writers like Robinson and Piscinu teach me that medicine comes in many more forms than medical school teaches, including the stories we tell, and that the power to heal also comes with the power to harm. Derda teaches me that medicine is always already more than just helpful and more than just harmful. And Wilson teaches me to hold space for both rightful critique and necessary hope about the role of psychotropic medication, medications to alleviate mental suffering. By the time I made it through a couple more cycles of hypomania and depression, I finally started medications myself during graduate school. During this time, I read, read Maggie Nelson's Bluettes, a startlingly beautiful work that explores the complexities of suffering in the face of illness and disability. I opened my master's thesis with a passage from Bluettes where Nelson describes not only her own suffering, but that of a friend she is closely caring for. I do not feel my friend's pain, but when I unintentionally cause her pain, I wince as if I hurt somewhere, and I do. Often in exhaustion, I lay my head down on her lap in her wheelchair, and I tell her how much I love her, that I'm so sorry she's in so much pain, pain I can witness and imagine, but that I do not know. She says if anyone knows this pain besides me, it is you and Jay, her lover. This is generous, for to be close to her pain has always felt like a privilege to me, even though pain could be defined as that which we typically aim to avoid. Illness like pain could also be defined as that which we typically aim to avoid. I did not choose to be close to my own illness, yet I did choose to be here in medical school, close to the illnesses of so many others, with the privilege and authority to attempt to care for them. My education may be adequately preparing me to treat disease, but I worry that I may, may never be adequately prepared to actually care for the whole person who experiences illness because of those diseases. I worry that I, will, that I will know a patient's disease, 
but not know their illness, what it means to be ill, how they experience illness, how illness affects their lives and those around them. But I'm also skeptical that I need or should or even can know all this in order to care. Perhaps to care for patients is to recognize their illness as that which I may witness and imagine but do not know, as Nelson does with her friend's pain. I worry that I will come to think of myself as the generous one, as the one offering the coveted cure, the nugget of truth. And so it is from Nelson that I get another lesson on doctoring. It is the patient, not I, who is the generous one in our encounter, the one who invites me to be close to them, their illness, their suffering, their life. I can perhaps witness and imagine their experience of illness, but no amount of closeness will ever let me wholly know it. And yet somewhere in there, in between what we might call empathy and appropriation, I, the doctor-to-be, must find a way to care for the ill. And somewhere in the space between where we touch, the patient and their suffering, me and my medical expertise, is where I seek beauty. Crashing from an episode of hypomania during the early years of medical school, I found myself in the bath ignoring my upcoming anatomy exam and instead reading Where Things Touch, a meditation on beauty by Bahar Orang, a poet and psychiatry resident. She writes, I asked for beauty, and among bodies and pain, illusions of irreproachability between linoleum floors and white lights is where I ended up. A bit further along, she continues, that many physicians, especially trainees, share my desire to think about beauty instead of suffering, or rather, to integrate beauty into reflections on suffering. I'll learn that many of us already understand, instinctively, that in place of suffering, there are islands of beauty. And not sentimentality, not cliche, beauty. All of us in any clinic or hospital, patients and caregivers, we are starved for it, beauty. I came to medical school through the beauty of literature's vulnerable intimacy, especially when such literature put words to vulnerability and suf illness, suffering, trauma, but also in healing and living fiercely in spite of. There is a place in which representations of such vulnerability slips into trauma porn, a commodification of it, but I hold, perhaps naively, onto the possibility for sincere beauty in sharing and attending to such vulnerability. I now realize that in coming to medicine, I wanted to get even closer to this beauty, as if it could become something more than just words on a page. In seeking beauty and vulnerability, in suffering, in illness, I do not seek to romanticize or even assuage it. I seek to hold space for, perhaps even touch, that suffering that exceeds my understanding of it. My love for literary analysis comes not from wanting to understand a text, but rather following how it ununderstands itself and in turn, how we, the readers, then come to ununderstand ourselves. Sometimes the excess is contradictory or uncomfortable or strange, and that is okay. The violence of medicine, its ugliness, is its constant denial of such excess through the illusion of understanding, of final conclusions, of bodily facts, and supposed mastery. Oran goes on to describe a moment of touching between herself and Frida Kahlo's famous painting, La Columna Rota. Here she offers an example of how we might encounter counter Kahlo's pain, her work's beauty, and its successes. Kahlo's not looking for empathy or excavation. She doesn't want my OT, PT, MD. I can only receive her in our estrangement. It would be violence to mine her for something that connects us, in order to love her or to care. As Virginia Woolf says about the person in pain, Kahlo opens up herself to me, or at me, or near me, to be just held in solitude. Orang invites us to know beauty here, is not to know Kahlo's experiences, to empathize with or excavate it, but rather to know that her experience exceeds such understanding. And it does not simply exceed it, but rejects it and names it as violence, leaving paradoxically a chasm of estrangement through which to touch her, to love her, to care for her. Bahar's words get us back to where we started, to Wolf. But Bahar's words also move us forward to another lesson on doctoring. Knowing a patient's experience of illness cannot be the prerequisite of care. In other words, empathy is excavation, as the violence of mining another for a point of connection in order to care for that other is not really care. Something else must come first. In medical school, we're socialized to empathize in the same way we're implicitly taught to approach everything. To understand it, to expose it to our gaze and investigations, to pick it apart, to appropriate and assimilate it, and to ultimately master it. To master not only medical knowledge of the body-mind, but also the experiences of the person who lives in that body-mind. I've experienced this firsthand as I've witnessed classmates ask well-intentioned but invasive questions about why mentally ill patients act or think in X, Y, Z ways. As I sit there listening to my classmates trying to understand, and perhaps even trying to empathize with an illness that I already understand through intimate lived experience, 
I can't help but flush with shame. I've been thinking and writing about shame a lot these past few years, which led me back to Touching Feeling by Eve Sedgwick. She theorizes shame as a performance where one absorbs and acts out the emotions others have towards them. In this way, I began to think about shame as functioning in the opposite direction as empathy. Whereas empathy reaches towards understanding the feelings of another, shame pulls another's feelings, often negative ones, into oneself. But this seems too easy, leading me too close to the overdetermined logic of, of empathy as not only an antidote to shame, but all of medicine's ills. I then turned to Sarah Ahmed's The Cultural Politics of Emotions, where she theorizes how the subject of shame takes in the view, that is the feelings, the judgments, of how they appear or are supposed to appear to real or imagined others, and thereby sees themselves as if they are the other. In this way, I start to see how empathy is not always so benevolent and can actually work in the same direction as shame. The empathizing self also takes in the view of real or imagined others' feelings and experiences, seeing themselves as if they actually are that other with whom they seek to empathize with. With shame, this process results in producing the one who is being shamed as other. Meanwhile, with empathy, this process reduce, results in producing the one who is being empathized with as other. This is how empathy, at least in the reductive way it is often mobilized in medicine, risks getting in the way of caring for another. It can just reproduce or defer the othering, moving us further, not closer to care. Farther, not closer to care. So if empathy is not necessarily the way forward to care, then what is? I find a possible answer by staying with Sedgwick and Ahmet, or staying with the trouble, as Donna Haraway might say, or tolerating the ambiguity, as Anzal Dua urges. Back in that same year I first read Wolf's A Room of One's Own, I also read E. Sedgwick's seminal essay on paranoid versus reparative reading for the first time. It's one of those essays that keeps pulling me back even in medical school. In the essay, Sedgwick writes how paranoid inquiry is only one way, among many other ways, of seeking, finding, and organizing logic, knowledge, despite seeming to have increasingly become the only way. She goes on to characterize paranoid reading and writes, quote, the first imperative of paranoia is there must be no bad surprises, by which she means that paranoid inquiry is always already anticipating all that is bad. Medicine is always already anticipating all that is wrong with the body-mind. To read from a reparative position, however, is, quote, to surrender the knowing, anxious, paranoid determination that no horror shall ever come as new. It can seem realistic and necessary to experience surprise. Because there can be terrible surprises, however, there can also be good ones. Because the reading, reader has room to realize the future may be different from the present, it is also possible for her to entertain such profoundly painful, profoundly re relieving, ethically crucial possibilities as that the past, in turn, could have happened differently from the way it actually did. Reading that passage anew, I was struck for the first time how much it echoed Ahmed's theorizing in her book, Strange Encounters another text I find myself going back to over and over again. For Ahmed, such a generous reading or encounter is also a meeting between two elements that involve surprise. A meeting between a reparative reader and a text, for example, or perhaps two people, a doctor and a patient. Ahmed writes that such a generous encounter is not a meeting between already constituted subjects who know each other. Rather, the encounter is premised on the absence of a knowledge that would allow one to control the encounter or to predict its outcome. Struc the surprising nature of encounters can be understood in relation to the structural possibility that we may not be able to read the bodies of others. My literary education has not taught me to read the bodies of patients, but rather, more crucially, to recognize that I may not or cannot. Further on, Ahmed writes, a generous encounter may be in such a way that the one who is already assimilated can still surprise, can still move beyond the encounter which names her and holds her in place. Surprise makes room in the encounter for the beauty that Orang describes, an excess that is free to take others or us or both elsewhere entirely. Maybe this is what it means for something to move you. Maybe this is what it means for Maggie Nelson to name generosity in the closeness of our friend's pain. Maybe this is what it means for Wolf to surprise us by starting her essay with but and taking us somewhere we didn't expect. Maybe this is what it means to care. So it is Ahmed and Cedric who offer me a final, for this talk at least, lesson on doctoring. Care should be predicated upon being generous and not knowing, and allowing oneself to be surprised by that which is still unknown and ultimately unknowable. I want to walk into the 1,000th room with the patient with depression and still be surprised by what I find. To still not fully know what depression is for that person or psychiatry in general, 
despite my wealth of medical knowledge, personal experience, and mindful of literary representations. I want to be moved by that surprise to care for that whole person, not just their depression, justly, ethically, creatively, and tenderly. One winter in medical school, while in the depths depths of my own worst episode of depression, I met one of my psychiatry mentor's patients. We'll call her Kay. I've now worked with Kay for over three years. She knows I share some of her mental illness experience, even if only just a sliver. Even after all these months working together, I still continue to be surprised at every appointment. I'm still surprised each time by Kay's generosity in inviting me into her life so intimately, so close, closely, and entrusting me with her care. I'm surprised every time by what new insights Kay offers about her experience of illness and what new insights those reveal about my own. I'm surprised that my love for and training in literature, as well as my own illness experience, really are assets in caring for another, not just in theory, but in practice. Even after a decade working with Kay, my psychiatry mentor still seems surprised too. And even Kay still finds herself surprised at what she's able to do, to think, to say, to change, and to feel. Somewhere in the midst of the pain, the violence, the reductiveness, the overburdened systems, and all the other limitations of medicine as we know it, we found our own island of beauty where the three of us can hold on to that surprise and ultimately hold on to each other. Take care. Thank you.